Yeah, uh, Mohan said it. What is the proper way for a disciple to develop his or her relationship with Srila Prabhupada and with a spiritual master? We have heard that one should give one's heart to his or her spiritual master. But it is hard to relate how to give your heart to both Srila Prabhupada and spiritual master. Kindly explain. It's a very good question. I'm eager to hear what you have to say about this. <laughs> uh, I, well, I'm not sure I can give that much Shastric reference in answer to this question. I can speak to you only from some practical experiences myself and realizations. In fact, I, I remember speaking on this topic, um, I think it was for last year for my Vyasa Puja. I spoke on this topic. And uh, I'm going to explain it from my own frame of reference and my own experience of Srila Prabhupada and the previous Acharyas, Srila uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, uh, because my experience with Srila Prabhupada is that the more I hear from him, the more my appreciation for them increases. And the more that I hear from them, the more I appreciate what Srila Prabhupada has given me in terms of their association in his teachings. It's sort of like a, a mutually uh, what's the word? Enhancing. Uh, enhancing. Enhancing, yes. Uh, relationship with each other. And uh, I had an experience. I, I'm trying to remember exactly how he described it. Yes, okay, I remember now. I don't, I don't want to bring it just simply from memory. It should be something that should be living that I'm always experiencing. <laughs> but uh, I, when I first started, um, when I came to Mayapur in 2020, I was... Uh, I had the opportunity to listen to Srila Prabhupada's lectures more than I had ever had the opportunity before. Let's put it that way. I mean, I've listened to his lectures. I read read all of his books, and uh, but now I found myself sitting down a minimum of four times a day, either in doing my daily exercises or in honoring Pashadam and just nobody else because I was alone. <laughs> it was me and Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> and uh, as I was listening and, and to his lectures every day, somehow they became a, a lot more relevant, more than they had ever become before. Uh, and the reason why I gradually realized their relevance even more is because I spent more time also over the course of the last two years uh, than I had previously studying the work of the previous Acharyas, works of the previous Acharyas, especially for those who attend my class, listening to Brihad Bhagavatamrita. I've been studying very intensely, Brihad Bhagavatamrita for almost two years now. And along with my studies in Brihad Bhagavatamrita, also included studies in Lago Bhagavatamrita, especially Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, Sarata Darshini, Srila Jiva Goswami in the Sundabras, Lago Vaishnava Toshini, Brihad Vaishnava Toshini. I found myself going there a lot more than I had gone previously. And I found that, that I wasn't really reading Srila Prabhupada's books so much as I had been previously. I was reading the books of the previous Chayas, and uh, they were enhancing uh, for, my, for myself 
my own realizations of the topic. And uh, but yet, along with reading the works of the previous acharyas, I was always listening to Srila Prabhupada every day. That's my daily sustenance. <clears throat> and one thing that evolved over the course of the last two years is that Srila Prabhupada's lectures that I was listening to every day, they became deeper than I'd ever heard them. I mean, I've heard them before, I listened to them, but I began to realize that Srila Prabhupada was speaking on topics, the same topics I had been delving in. They may not have been given as much detail as what I found in, in the works of the previous Acharyas, but they were all just simply very valuable nuggets, gold nuggets, that I were coming to life. And I, I began to appreciate how these are all coming from the lips of my spiritual master. It's coming from the lips of Srila Prabhupada. And uh, Prabhupada is giving me the association. I, of course, one book I, I read sometimes relentlessly is uh, Amritavani. <laughs> I love it. So many of the things that I find in Amritavani, which is in Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's instructions on many relevant spiritual topics. Uh, hearing them from Srila Prabhupada, again, even though I went elsewhere, only increased my appreciation even more for what I was hearing from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, Srila Jiva Goswami. And uh, I would say that that experience in of itself convinced me of the potency of, uh, of, of Guru Parampara, something that Srila Prabhupada always spoke about, uh, always embodied. He always embodied it because whenever we heard from Srila Prabhupada, he was always quoting our previous acharyas. He was always speaking about Parampara. And uh, the result being is that I found that my relationship with Srila Prabhupada and my love for Srila Prabhupada became just ever increasing as a result of hearing the words of the previous acharyas, which may have been seen as listening to them directly and bypassing Srila Prabhupada. Now, I wasn't reading so much of Srila Prabhupada's books in the last two years. I'm just reading all these other acharyas I mentioned. But what happened was, is that Srila Prabhupada's lectures that I was listening to every day became so pregnant, so much more pregnant. And I believe it, it was a result of his blessings because he always represented the parampara. I believe in answer to your question, and you might say I've gone about it in a in an indirect way, but in answer to your question, I would say that for devotees now, if they listen to their spiritual masters, and if their spiritual master gives them what they have received from our parampara, there's no confusion between where where to repose in one's love because the power of disciplic succession comes through in that way. And that's what Prabhupada taught. Shariya Vishaya, what is it? Nistara Bhayechi Kema. Narutam Das Thakura. I get lost since I start quoting Sanskrit. I'm so used to speaking just simply English. <laughs> but uh, one has to get the mercy of uh, of the spiritual master and the Vaishnavas, you know, and uh, both have to be there if one actually wants to 
achieve the perfection of devotional service. It's the duty of the spiritual master to give the parampara. And uh, if the spiritual master delivers the parampara through disciplic succession, then an ever-increasing appreciation will be there if devotees also listen from Shila, listen to Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> that, I believe, is the duty of everyone because he's our founder, Acharya. Everything that we've learned, we've learned by his mercy. Everything we have, the association we have, is by his mercy. Some devotees may see it as the mercy of their spiritual master, but where would their spiritual master be without Srila Prabhupada? I'd say it's not just a duty. To say it's a duty almost somehow implies that something I have to do and I need to be and more spontaneous in the execution of, of devotional service than to simply do the things I have to do. I have to do the things that I want to do. But if, if the spiritual masters remind the devotees of Srila Prabhupada's presence, his example, his purity, his compassion, and everything else that he brought to us in a very relevant way to the lives of the devotees, the devotees will want to hear from Srila Prabhupada. And there's no confusion between giving one's love to one's spiritual master and giving one's love to Srila Prabhupada. There should be no conflict. It's not a divided heart. It's not a divided heart as long as the heart of the speaker is there with Prabhupada. <laughs> it's not a divided heart. And uh, I would say that this realization became exceptionally enhanced for me in the last two years spending most of my time associating with previous Acharyas, <laughs> but yet listening to Srila Prabhupada every day. I don't know yeah. if that answers the question. It may raise more questions than I've answered. If it does, oh, no. I'm, I'm fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it perfectly answers the question because the question is asked from the framework of uh, quote unquote uh, ordinary consciousness, which, uh, or, you know, I don't want to be offensive to anyone, some sort of neophytish consciousness, which always tries to find some sort of um, uh, contradictions or, uh, you know, always divides something. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the best uh, Shastrik or Acharya's illustration to the point which you give is the verse from Manak Shiksha by Srila Raghunath Das Goswami, Nadarma Nadarma Shruti Ganam Niruktam Kila Kuru Vraje Radha Krishna Prachura Parichari Mehata Nus Sachisunam Nandishwara Pati Sutatve Guru Varam Mukunda Prestatve Smara Parama Jastram Nanu Manaha where he says to his mind, uh, please uh, don't uh, divide yourself into many branches. Try to understand that uh, everything which you are doing is connected to one uh, Radha Krishna, and Radha Krishna is the same. Uh, you know, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is not different than Radha and Krishna. And your spiritual master is not different from Radha and Krishna in a sense because they have very intimate relationship. Therefore, the ekantata or uh, one pointedness of our love or our relationship is not disturbed by having so many objects of our love because this all objects of our life they are uh, of our love they are united they are 
the same. <laughs> they're connected, intimately connected with each other. And therefore, there is no contradiction. You know, we still, the, the love is still one-pointed. Uh, when we see the unity, when we divide in our consciousness, our spiritual master is something, and Srila Prabhupada is something, previous acharyas is uh, something else, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is something else, and Radha Krishna is again something else. Uh, then it's like this, but if we understand the unity, uh, the tightness of their relationship and their love, then, uh, you know, by relating to one, we're relating to all of them. <laughs> by loving one, we're loving all of them. And uh, love to uh, anyone in this uh, unified chain uh, means increasing uh, love to everyone else. As you said, you know, your appreciation of previous acharyas increased and that increased your love and appreciation to Srila Prabhupada because uh, it's very clear that they are intimately connected. So it's a perfect answer to this question. <laughs> and you gave a perfect philosophical explanation to it as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the next question is also very interesting. Maharaj, do you personally can tell that you please Srila Prabhupada with your uh, service? How, how can you tell? Please share how you develop your relationship with Srila Prabhupada, how we can understand what is the will of Srila Prabhupada in our day-to-day -day life and actions, what he wants from us, what he expects from us. Why our connection with Srila Prabhupada is sometimes very clear and self-evident and sometimes it fades away, becomes a little flimsy, uh, etc. So uh, the question is, how, how do we know that Srila Prabhupada is pleased with our action, with our service, uh, and how to make sure that uh, our understanding of his pleased is real, not just something imaginary, and how you uh, tighten the connection. Well, relevant in this topic. should I understand that the question is being asked from a frame of reference of myself being Prabhupada's disciple? Or should I understand that the frame of reference is a question that's being asked on behalf of all the devotees who are listening? How do they know when Srila Prabhupada is pleased? Uh, I think you should start with the first, uh, and then you can uh, broaden the perspective to everyone. Because this question is multi, it has many aspects. Facets. To it. Yeah. Facet, yeah. yeah you you can start with your personal experience because there is, how do you personally can tell that you please Srila Prabhupada? So this, this, the first aspect is your personal experience. Well, from my own personal experience, I know that any realization I get, any spiritual happiness I get, uh, any benefit that I get in terms of my Krishna consciousness uh, can never manifest without Prabhupada's mercy and his blessings. I mean, that's a conviction I've had ever since I came to the Krishna consciousness movement and decided to surrender myself to Prabhupada's lotus feet, that uh, I'm not responsible for anything of any value in my life. If I have anything of value in my life, it's because I've taken shelter of Srila Prabhupada. Realizations are valuable. Spiritual happiness is valuable. Association with Vaishnavas is valuable. Uh, 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 the uh, opportunity to take darshan and render service to to the deities is valuable. Anything of the, any value that gives me some spiritual happiness 
can only manifest because of Prabhupada. So if I get any of these things, any of these experiences of, of spiritual happiness, a realization, something that, you know, that, you know, just like the night before last, I was speaking to Shiva Maharaj and we were talking about, we were talking about Braj, talking about a realization I had from reading one of the commentaries of Jiva Goswami, where he was explaining how Krishna is himself and gives himself completely so much that even if he's in a solitary place, alone, he's always behaving, he's always acting in, in his in his um, in the, his form of or in a way that is completely forgetful of his divinity and I started to think about the examples of in Ananda Vrindavan Shampoo how Krishna was was uh, you know stealing butter and he was looking at his reflection and, that, and he was alone and Jiva Goswami had given this example that even when he's alone in a solitary place <laughs> Here he was alone, and he was looking at his reflection in the in the column. And, and he, as he was looking at the reflection in the column, he was thinking, "This might be Balaram. He's caught me, and I'm stealing butter." And 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 uh, and therefore his, his immediate reaction was, "Oh my, oh brother, please don't tell mother. <laughs> if you don't tell mother, I I'll share some of this brother with you." And and. So many examples, and as I was speaking to Shiva Maharaj about this topic, and because it was so relevant to the points I was discussing that day, I was feeling some, I was feeling some pleasure, undeserved pleasure. I always know that if I get spiritual pleasure, it's undeserved. And I always remain conscious of that. If it's undeserved pleasure, if it's undeserved happiness, it means there's only one person I can attribute in my life, that I've gotten something, received something undeserved. Because if I look at my own qualification, I don't deserve any of it. Nothing. And therefore, you know, put two and two together, and therefore I understand that I can only experience these realizations, I can only experience some happiness, I can only appreciate and relish the association of devotees because somehow Prabhupada's pleased with, with my efforts, my tiny little efforts, my tiny little steps to do something. Somehow Prabhupada is pleased. And uh, I, that's how I, how I in, in my life, I live on those drops. I live on those drops. They carry me. They sustain me. They're they're life giving. And uh, so that's first part of the question. I guess you asked how do I know how Prabhupada is pleased. I wish I could say that I know Prabhupada is always pleased with me, which means that I would also have to reflect in saying that. I'm always feeling spiritual happiness. <laughs> I, I, but I don't. So I can understand that sometimes I may be doing something that's pleasing to Srila Prabhupada and sometimes I'm not doing something that's pleasing to Srila Prabhupada. But if I know I'm doing something that's not pleasing to Srila Prabhupada, I have faith that Prabhupada will show me that I'm not doing something that's pleasing to him and will correct me from within. And uh, because he's not different from, from uh, he's Chacha Guru. And uh, he's within the heart. And uh, when I'm not doing something that's pleasing to Srila Prabhupada, I I'm quite sure that uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get some mercy. <laughs> and uh, because it's always there, it's always available. And uh, I may get a little, uh, little correction so that I can do something to to make him smile and become pleased again. So 
you are speaking in retrospect in one sense. Uh, the at least one aspect of this question: How do we know at the moment when we are uh, supposed to choose something uh, at the at the time of choice, which is sometimes very difficult? Uh, how do we know what Srila Prabhupada wants me to choose or to do uh, uh, at the moment of the difficult choice and in general, uh, the general uh, direction of my life? Is it pleasing to Srila Prabhupada what I'm doing or is it something which is, uh, which is my own concoction? Well, I often use that uh, that purport that Srila Prabhupada speaks about in the third canto of the Bhagavatam in the prayers of Brahma for creative potency in an effort to answer that question or, sim or similar questions. When Prabhupada explains that fortune is a person who's entrusted with the responsible work and when in the execution of his responsible work, if he's always conscious that he's subordinate to the will of the Lord, then even though the external result may not appear to be the right result, but because he's conscious he's subordinate, then it will become right because he's in the right consciousness. And uh, if he's not conscious of his subordinate position, was well, Krishna say also in the Bhagavad Gita, 18th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, and all activities just depend upon me and work under my protection. Such devotional service, be fully conscious of me. If you're conscious of me, you'll cross over all the obstacles of conditioned life by my grace. But if you do not work through such consciousness and act through false ego, not hearing me, you'll be lost. In a similar vein, in, in the execution of our services, when we have to make decisions, we should try to make the decision which is in terms of subordinate to the instructions that we've been we received from Krishna and his authorized representatives. In my case, I try to, to make decisions in terms of what I may have read in Srila Prabhupada's books, uh, what I may have heard in one of, of Prabhupada's lectures, but I'm also very, very conscious that in following Srila Prabhupada, uh, that I, I'm very conscious that sometimes it's more important to follow the spirit of Prabhupada's instructions than a letter. Because I believe, and we talked about this once before, I believe, in the maybe it was when you asked me to speak to the Bhaktivedanta Academy. I think I talked about this, the, the difference between the spirit and the, and the letter. So I was giving the example, I seem to recall, I was giving, that sometimes people take the letter of Prabhupada's instructions and then when giving it to others, they have a tendency to ram it down others' throat. Whereas Prabhupada's spirit was not like that at all. <laughs> Prabhupada's example was not like that at all. Of course, Prabhupada could sometimes be very strict, but he was also very liberal. And uh, he always take, took into account what was best for the for the recipient to hear and to accept. And he was very, very conscious. In fact, I even remember bringing up that point in reference to a, a, a something from Prabhupada Lilamrita, how Prabhupada was giving talks at one Indian man's home in Calcutta. The Indian man was a, uh, he was a diplomat of sorts and a well-known, influential person. And Prabhupada, he invited Prabhupada to come and speak. And he had gathered uh, many, many people to hear from him. And one of the things that this man described as his, as his greatest appreciation for Srila Prabhupada is that he understood everyone's mentality in the room. And he spoke because the person who invited them knew the mentality of everyone in the room. 
And what he appreciated about Prabhupada is he understood the mentality of everyone in the room, and Prabhupada spoke to each one individually according to what they were able to understand and accept. And he did it all in one in one talk. <laughs> I mean, that's Prabhupada. So in the same way that uh, try to do what Prabhupada wants. Try to remember Prabhupada's instructions, what he would want us to do in, a, in that particular situation, and and but then depend on him for the for the result. Be conscious that I'm subordinate to Prabhupada's instruction and Prabhupada's example, and try to remember sometimes in the execution of Prabhupada's instructions, it may be just as important to follow the spirit of Prabhupada's instructions than to follow the letter. Because if we follow the letter all the time, sometimes we may find ourselves following an instruction Prabhupada gave to somebody who needed that instruction. And he may sell something completely different to somebody else who needed a different instruction. And this is how, an answer to another question, how I reconcile contradictions. Because Prabhupada Sometimes we have a tendency to to be like cherry pickers. You know, we just go in and we pick out what what suits our 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 instruction from Prabhupada, what suits our own conclusion, and we pick and choose. But Prabhupada gave different instructions according to different time, places, and circumstances, and we have to be careful to not pull everything out and to say it's universally applicable but try to understand the spirit behind the instructions. So I would say that in answer to your question and avoiding presenting it in a retrospect way, that's how I would deal with having to make a decision. I would want to make sure when I make that decision, I'm making the decision which I feel Prabhupada would want me to do under the given circumstances and time and place that he would want me to decide and then depend on his divine will and Krishna's divine will for the result. And if at some point I see that maybe I have to alter, maybe I have to change, Prabhupada changed. He altered many things that he said that about one thing he said one time and at a later date he said something quite different. Was Prabhupada a contradictory personality? No, he was an expert judge of time, place, and circumstance. He would want us to become like that also. Does that answer the question? Or do you? Yeah. That, no, does that... it does. It does. It does. But there is another aspect of this question, but I, uh, if you allow me, I would like to elaborate something. Uh, I would what you more than that. allow you. I, I welcome it because I said this was going to be dialogue and you're supposed to be yeah. speaking too and I'm not supposed to be the, you know, the limelight of the, of the presentation. Yeah. So first of all, it's a beautiful answer to the first part of the question that how do we know if Prabhupada pleased? You know, it, basically we should know it because we have something valuable in our life. If something comes to our life, realization or some unusual feeling or some experience uh, that should be the indication that somebody above us is pleased with us because otherwise how do we get it it's a perfect answer to the first part of the question uh, and if we view all the amazing gifts which we get practically on a daily basis like today i'm in delhi and always when when i come to delhi i'm always uh, overwhelmed by the hospitality of local devotees gopal krishna maharaj trained them so well <laughs> amazing <laughs> totally yeah amazing. yeah the, you feel his presence everywhere yeah yeah and uh, you know i i feel mm, gopal krishna maharaj's presence and i feel you know if if we look at this as Prabhupada's mercy uh, totally undeserved mercy coming to us uh, and mercy means Prabhupada is pleased with us so that's a 
very good answer. But I wanted to a uh, little bit elaborate on what you said, uh, speaking on the other part of the question. I also appreciate very much what you said, is that how do we judge uh, whether what we're doing is pleasing to Prabhupada or not, and the moment of when we're doing it, uh, I think there, is, there was very important and valuable aspect of what you said, is that uh, what is the motivation uh, of why you're doing this? If the motivation is false ego, then for sure it's not pleasing, no matter how good you're doing. <laughs> You may be doing amazing things, but if you're motivated by your false identity, false ego, uh, desire for prestige, then there is no question of anyone would be satisfied besides yourself. And even this satisfaction will be very illusory and temporary and flickering. Uh, so I wanted to confirm it. Uh, basically, uh, that's how I would answer this question. If you're doing not what you want, but what somebody else wants, and if you're sure that somebody else uh, whose will you're fulfilling is doing something which is pleasing to Prabhupada, then only you can be sure that what you're doing is pleasing to Prabhupada. <laughs> you yourself not a perfect judge, but if you're doing the will of somebody else who is uh, dear to Prabhupada, who has done so much for him, uh, uh, and you're doing it, uh, you know, willingly and happily, uh, then uh, for sure Prabhupada will be pleased. You know, I, I sometimes I say that the happiest period of my life, uh, the absolutely the best period of my life was uh, when I was, well, there were different good periods in my life but when i came to sweden and i de facto although i came to sweden to surf in the bbt but very quickly i realized that kirtiraj prabhu appropriated me and there is very little time for my direct service to bbt and practically 24 hours a day i had to surf kirtiraj in his uh and he was very spontaneous. He was not following Vaidhi Bhakti. He was following Raganuga Bhakti. <laughs> he would go to bed around two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I had to be next to him and basically fulfill whatever he wanted at this particular moment. And he was yelling with his loud voice through the whole Swedish farm. Almix guard, why do you not come here, do this, do that? <laughs> and, uh, you know, in retrospect, I, that was the happiest period of my life, and I was absolutely happy. And uh, the reason why I was happy, because I was doing not something which I wanted, but because I was doing something which he wanted. <laughs> and uh, because he was doing something which was uh, very important and valuable for Srila Prabhupada, and Srila Prabhupada was pleased. So uh, at least this is one uh, very valuable and important criteria, how to decide what to do. Uh, just give up your own ideas and do uh, what somebody who knows what he's doing or who is close to Srila Prabhupada asks you to do. And uh, I'm sure many people can confirm my experience, like Mad Mohan, who is serving you, he probably can confirm this completely. And uh, you know. So that was also a very important uh, answer and I just wanted to elaborate on this part of your answer. Thank you. Can I can I also take that a little bit? Yes, further? sure. Yes, uh, I very much agree. And your example was good. It was very good because I can imagine at that particular time what it must have been like. Because I know I know Kirti Raj's mood back then. <laughs> and <laughs> I could just imagine what you had to go through, but it was—it's like it—it's like a sweet austerity. It's like a sweet austerity 
to give up your own personal ambitions to satisfy somebody else. And what to speak of to satisfy somebody else whose desires you trust are, are well connected uh, to doing something which is pleasing to Prabhupada. And uh, I know that for myself, I've oftentimes said this to devotees, to my disciples, that that uh, for me, that's how that's how I make decisions. I mean, especially what I feel are very important decisions. Uh, I go to the to the I speak, just reveal them to the devotees I trust who I really who are motivated to please Prabhupada, who in my heart are representatives of Srila Prabhupada, and uh, and who by serving them gives me the, such a satisfaction as if I'm serving Srila Prabhupada. And and as I've many times even stated that sometimes because they have a tendency to try to treat me as a friend, I have to try to find secretive ways to do something that's pleasing them, pleasing to them, because they'll never allow me to serve them otherwise. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, an, it's, it's the doorway, it's the threshold you know, to, to pleasing Prabhupada. It's, it's uh, and uh, I believe every devotee should have that. And if they don't, they're, they're the losers. <laughs> they're the losers, they lose. If they don't have a, a, a doorway, <laughs> You know that uh, brings them to uh, to serving Prabhupada. So uh, your example was very good, and I just wanted to add that to it as well. Okay, so I'll connect the last part of the second question with the third question because they are quite quite connected. In any case. So the, the second part of the second question was uh, why our connection with Srila Prabhupada is sometimes very clear and self-evident and sometimes it, be, it fades away. And uh, the third question, how not to lose the prominence of Srila Prabhupada and pass these values on to the next generation of devotees. So... I, I think, you know, it's it's connected because first you have to establish your own uh, relationship and connection. Then only you can uh, talk about uh, giving it further to other people. So please tell, share with us what, what you think, what uh, is the reason why sometimes we feel some strong connection and sometimes we feel that the connection is not there, it's just a figment of imagination or something like this. And uh, how to establish it firmly and how to give it to others. I would say that uh, to answer that question, it's quite similar to uh, what Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur describes in Madhurya Kandambani is the differences between anishtata bhakti and, and nishtata bhakti that you know how do we feel Prabhupada's presence well it's because of you know the there are sick there because of the obstacles that exist in anishtata bhakti unsteady devotional service such as yudhava kalpa indecisiveness you know and and uh, the, the tendency to to enjoy uh, bhakti uh, uh, by uh, enjoying the music. yes and uh, uh, I, I forget what the first one is what is it <laughs> um, the first one Utsahamai, and yeah, Utsahamai. Then, uh, yeah false enthusiasm <laughs> false enthusiasm We're, we may be very enthusiastic about our surrender to Srila Prabhupada and, 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 but it's not it's, it's based on a false conception of ourselves and uh, and then these are all simply characteristics of a, of of devotional service, which is unsteady. How can we expect to be steady 
in our connection with Srila Prabhupada if we still have have these characteristics of unsteady bhakti. And uh, if we want to become more steady in the execution of our devotional service, then uh, uh, we have to, you know, this, as Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur describes, the transitional stage between Anishtita Bhakti and Nishtita Bhakti is uh, Nasta Prayesha Abhideshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya. <laughs> and I would say that uh, hearing about Srila Prabhupada is also Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya. And uh, if we want to be steady in our, in our uh, faith, in the execution of our devotional service, we should not be clueless about who is Srila Prabhupada. Uh, we should hear about him more. We should read about him more. We should read about his 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 exalted qualities and his loving exchanges with with devotees, his compassion, his spontaneity, in, and at the same time his his strictness. Every aspect of 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 a devotee is, are all embodied in in the personality of Srila Prabhupada. So much so that you know. You know, to know him is to love him. And uh, if devotees are, unfortunately, I, I find that many times devotees are just clueless about who is Srila Prabhupada. And I believe it's the duty of of their preceptors to somehow remind them that nobody should be clueless about who is Srila Prabhupada in this Krishna consciousness movement. And the more we hear about him and keep him alive, then then we can be a, become a little bit more situated in the platform. As I said, the transitional stage is Nasta Praesha Abhideshu, Nitya Bhagavata Sevya. Then we can come to the platform of more remembrance of Srila Prabhupada. That, along with our appreciation of hearing from those who remind us about Srila Prabhupada. And the uh, as we said before, um, we should not. Be, we should be very careful to not divide our love in the ways that you so nicely and philosophically described. Um, but therefore, the devotees should be very careful to not relegate Prabhupada into some distant. Uh, what's the word? I'm ir irrelevant <laughs> position because I have my guru. He's, he's relevant to everyone. And uh, I believe that's how we can keep Prabhupada alive now in the Krishna consciousness movement. And if that same spirit is there, it can it can continue to future generations. It can't be artificial. Uh, I, you know me when it comes to uh, artificially imposing, you know, rules and regulations on people. Uh, I'm I'm a firm advocate of inspiration. That its its inspiration comes from hearing, and inspiration comes both by hearing and by exemplifying what one is hearing and what one is teaching. If both are there, inspiration will come. It's infectious. If we talk more about Shiva Prabhupada in this way, and if we and and we act. In remembrance of his personality, and it's infectious. People want to keep Prabhupada alive, rather than just telling everybody, "You must read." I, I, <laughs> it's just it can only go so far with "You must read Prabhupada Limamrita." <laughs> it only takes people sometimes just only so far. They just they can't get beyond. I know I must read, but you know I've got so many other things to do, so many other books I want to read, and, and you know. I, I, my Guru Maharaj is, is, you know, is speaking on this this wonderful topic, and I have only so much time that that. You know, okay, you must read Prabhupada Lilamrita. It can only go so far, so it needs to be inspired. Uh, and then, the more it's inspired, then we'll be able to remember him more. I was just listening. Just the other day, Prabhupada was talking about this point on, on, on a lecture. He was talking about two things. He was talking about, oh, actually just this morning, he was talking about writing. 
he might be happy to hear this. <laughs> Prabhupada was talking about how his, he, he was really emphasizing it, very, very important. He said, devotees must write if they want to realize. And, uh, and uh, speaking about that, but he was also, the other day, he was speaking about what we hear, if we repeat, what we hear, we will remember. He said, if we don't repeat, we won't remember. And therefore, he was speaking about how a, a devotee is uh, very kind and compassionate to others by repeating what he has heard so that others can derive the same benefit and advantage. advantage and you will remember. He was specifically speaking about persons who want to remember. So same thing with Prabhupada. We hear about him. We tell others about him. We speak about topics that are very inspiring about him to us. And if we relish it, that's how Lord Chaitanya distributed love of Krishna by relishing it himself. And by his relishing it, he was giving it to others. Same way, love for Prabhupada. It's, it's very interesting because just today, <clears throat> on the way to Delhi, and I had a long ride, somebody, some, uh, some follower of mine sent to me his essay on some topic connected with the current situation in Ukraine. And I was reading it, and I really appreciated the way he described some internal understanding of what's going on. And it, it has become very clear to me that, uh, you know, if he would not write this, he would probably forget uh, all these realizations which are coming to him. But because he crystallized them in putting it in writing, choosing the special words, uh, and uh, that uh, it, it really, uh, helped him to imbibe uh, this experience and, uh, you know, make it very much alive. So uh, I really uh, thank you for this point that uh, we should write. We should not only speak, we should not only hear, we should also write. You know, it's one thing when you hear, it's completely other level if you try to repeat what you have heard but it's yet another level if you try to put it in writing and crystallizing it in a very uh, you know succinct and uh, proper way and then it, it goes really deeply and therefore we should hear about Prabhupada if we want to make it steady our understanding we should speak about Prabhupada and we should also write about Prabhupada <laughs> I'm speaking it because I wrote a book <laughs> I <do. laughs> with, diff with different stories of Srila Prabhupada and it really gave me uh, you know a lot of new it's one thing if you just read it but when you have to put it in writing and think about it and uh, think about different aspects how his personality transpires through this exchange which is there it becomes much more deeply ingrained in your heart that's for sure that's a very good advice because as you very aptly said in the beginning that the problem of unsteadiness is our unsteady mind and how to chasten the mind how to make the mind steady you know hearing is the beginning speaking is the next stage writing is the next stage <laughs> You know, and then, uh, you know, it becomes, uh, it, it really helps you to stabilize because writing is a, is a sort of meditation. It's a sort of smarana when you put it in, uh, you know, in a very uh, clear way, when you try to put it in a very clear way. So that's, that's a very uh, good and beautiful advice for sure. Uh, there was something else I wanted to say in this regard uh, about making it steady, you know, by steadying our mind. Basically, what you said, very important thing which you said, uh, you know, what is the sign 
of an unsteady mind. The first characteristic of an unsteady mind is that, uh, you know, the unsteady mind has many goals. It's many branched. Many branched, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Uh, there is no uh, very clear set of values in unsteady mind. And therefore, many things are equally available, uh, valuable. And because they're equally valuable, uh, you want to achieve this and you want to achieve that. You know, if you have a very clear set or hierarchy of values, and if you know that this is the top most value, then whatever you do, you will try to achieve this top most value. So basically, if we want to make our relationship with Srila Prabhupada uh, steady, then we have to, you know, put him uh, or his personality and, uh, you know, his role in our life on the top of our value system. And if he is there in the top of our value system, then all our endeavors will be directed to this. But if we have many equally valuable goals which we want to achieve, then, you know, we will have many branched intelligence. You know, it's like there is this deers which live and they have this many branched <laughs> crown and there's, and there. and there's... yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> so we will be <laughs> like them <laughs> that will be our minds <laughs> yeah branched mind. <laughs> many branched <laughs> minds we going out to... in every direction <laughs> yeah so Papa even said once, why be a jack of all trades when you could be master at one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, 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 jack of all trades. Yeah, that's uh, that's very much dependent on the value system. And, you know, value system reflects the level of steadiness of our mind or of our intelligence. That's very apt. So the, the next part of this question, <clears throat> how to give it to others, to the next generation, and what is the responsibility of the present generation in passing this legacy to uh, down the line to others? What would you say about the responsibility of the well, I think to some degree you already answered the question. How to give it to the next generation is by writing about Srila Prabhupada. Mm. Yeah. That's definitely a very relevant way. Writing about uh, how Srila Prabhupada, what Srila Prabhupada's instructions, his example, his life, uh, and his, his movement means to you and uh i believe that that if devotees leave behind these instructions very very valuable instructions i and i believe that they they should be extracted and every sincere serious follower of Srila Prabhupada should be leaving something behind for future generations because Prabhupada's life was just so variegated in the way in his way of dealings with the devotees but at the same time consistent both elements were there and, the, and then you can always see in any the, whatever devotees speak about Srila Prabhupada you can always take a thread and you can run that thread through their realizations and see Prabhupada's consistency but at the same time you can see how unique Prabhupada was in his dealings with people, as we described before. And the more we leave behind for future generations, and the more people become serious about cultivating pure bhakti, which is the only reason why Prabhupada came, and it's the only thing he came to give us, then the uh, it will naturally follow that uh, Prabhupada will be remembered and revered and kept alive within our, our society 
as long as we take the responsibility to keep Prabhupada alive within us within the society now by speaking about him and by sharing our realizations about him and, and by writing about him. Uh, that's the only hope for future generations. Otherwise, it's very easy to forget. Especially, you know, who knows? We can't predict. Who knows who, who Lord Chaitanya is going to send to to inspire, to revive, or whatever it may be. You know, the Krishna consciousness movement, as, as time, as it always does, changes everything. And uh, But we can't predict when that time will come and who Lord Chaitanya is going to come and who Shul Prabhupada is going to empower to come whenever the time is needed. But until then... Prabhupada is a Varandra Acharya. And it is I, nobody, at least I would say, it's undisputable, nobody presently who is going to even try to replace him. <laughs> yeah, what you said about writing again, or emphasize, emphasized about writing. You know, nowadays people, they write so much garbage in all this social media. <laughs> don't, <laughs> oh, get me, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, the, people are writing all the time, but they're writing on such subject matters, which are, you know, at the very least irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> That's generous. <laughs> <laughs> That's generous. <laughs> so, of course, there are good things to be found. I mean, I, I will not in any way, you know, diminish the importance of those Vaishnavas who've taken full advantage of social media and who give only substance, all blurries to substance. Yeah. I believe if everybody that, understands. Substance will, will reconcile all contradictions if substance is always put first and foremost in the center. And that's, you know, as I, as I said, writing is the best way of meditation because uh, when you write, you really have to go deeper into the, into the memory and everything and put it in a very proper and chaste way. So that's, you know, so many opportunities are there to write about Srila Prabhupada and his relevance to us and you know his his personality and his input into our life you know uh, just today we were driving through Rishikesh and uh, I was doing something and all of a sudden I heard uh, the sound of uh, loud chanting Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare somebody was sitting there and chanting it loudly with few few people then I don't think they were ISKCON devotees uh, I, I didn't even see where they are I just heard the uh, loud speakers when they were chanting but um, you know immediately uh, I remembered, you know, if it was not for Srila Prabhupada, probably he would not sit here and chant Hare Krishna mantra. <laughs> it's directly or indirectly a result of Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna mantra is so famous now, and everyone is just, you know, you, you know, everyone in India just see you and says Hare Krishna, Jai Radhe, and, you know, <laughs> and immediately recognize you. And it's, it's amazing how... Srila Prabhupada's influence is growing and growing and growing over the time. How it becomes more and more relevant, you know, and more more prominent in the lives of people. So but to speak of when the Prime Minister of India promotes Prabhupada. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so we have the question number four. How a disciple's relationship with Srila Prabhupada matures during different stages of spiritual life? Of course, you already answered this uh, by 
speaking about anishtita and nishtita sadhana bhakti then um, you know relationship is also anishtita sambandha and nishtita sambandha so it um, uh, i guess you can you can make a case and say that you know, when Shraddha is there, it means Shraddha and Srila Prabhupada. When Sadhu Sangha is there, it means Sadhu Sangha with Srila Prabhupada. When Bhajana Kri is there, it's, it's uh, again in relationship with Srila Prabhupada. But maybe you can uh, give some other uh, angle to this question. Uh, well, I'd say that, I, I mean, I could give it some other angle, but... Uh... How much time do we have left? We still have, uh, I would say, half an hour, and then we can keep 15 minutes for the questions. Okay. Also, All and right. we only have two more, two more topics to deal with, five and six, and then after that we can speak, answer the questions. Well, again, I guess this is a, a, I have a similar question about the question because I would say the maturation of a relationship with Srila Prabhupada also depends upon the, uh, the, the degree of absorption in Prabhupada's instructions. And, uh, and uh, I'm not... I'm not an advocate that everyone will have the same degree of absorption in Prabhupada and those who do not have the same degree of absorption in Srila Prabhupada are considered to be less um, less privileged or less advanced because ultimately Palena Parachiyate, you know, we judge a, judge a tree by its fruit that the essence of bhakti is to be absorbed in always remembering Krishna and never forgetting Krishna. Smartavyam satatam vishnu vismata vyodna jatu chit. So absorption, uh, if somebody's actually absorbed in Krishna consciousness, who's always speaking about Krishna, reminding others about Krishna, yari deki tarikaha krishna upadesh, then how can we say that there are less in a lesser position <laughs> than uh than somebody who's always absorbed and speaking about Prabhupada and uh and uh, you know there are certain devotees that I know like if you talk to Bhadri Narayan Maharaj you know he's always just filled with Prabhupada's stories you know there's, there's not a single class that he'll give where he hasn't he doesn't tell a story about Prabhupada, you know, it's just at it's, least three of them, <laughs> and they're always so wonderful. They're so wonderful, you know. That's like, and you know, they're so relishable. So, but if somebody gives a class and doesn't mention Srila Prabhupada as much as he does, so we say that the class is inferior. He's not. No, I, I wouldn't go so far to say that. That he's not absorbed in Srila Prabhupada to the same degree and therefore he's he's losing out in something absorption is the essence of our philosophy and to the more that we're ultimately absorbed in that which uh, helps us to remember Krishna and uh, certainly uh, not everybody is going to have the same level of absorption is what I'm going to say in the topics and memories of Srila Prabhupada but that in any way shouldn't uh, in any way counter anything that I've already said up until now about the importance of at least everybody having a foundational foundational relationship with Srila Prabhupada. Uh, that is essential for everyone who to have a healthy understanding of why he participates in the Krishna consciousness movement, why he sacrifices for the, for the sake of cooperation in the Krishna consciousness movement, unless there's a solid foundational understanding of Srila Prabhupada, devotees can very easily think that, uh, why should I cooperate and go and look for something else? And Prabhupada, of course, knowing 
that foundational principle of Srila Prabhupada will help keep a sense of cohesion in our movement. So I would say what's essential for everyone is that they're developing and advancing more in their foundational understanding of Srila Prabhupada and uh, seeing Prabhupada's presence everywhere <laughs> in, in the Krishna consciousness movement that not a blade of grass moves without his mercy, not a not a center in Iskand exists without his his divine glance, his his divine approval. Everything is meant for his pleasure. Everything should be used for spreading Krishna consciousness, which was his the the goal of, of establishing this this movement. And uh, the more we're reminded about that in the ways I described previously. Uh, by hearing about it in an inspirational way rather than the authoritative way, which is sometimes uh, has, a, has an opposite effect. Real authority comes from, again, by example. And uh, so uh, I'm always very conscientious, as well as I know many other devotees are very conscientious that if they're going to speak authoritatively, they better make sure they're they're following it themselves. Prabhupada was just speaking about this point <laughs> just, just yesterday in class <laughs> about the importance of teaching about an example by example. He said, without example, uh, it's very important to convince others. It's very difficult to convince others unless the example is there. And he was saying, and he was saying in a specific conversation, he was saying, therefore, my disciples. They must all be good examples if you want others to follow you. I have another question, which may be a little controversial. It's not listed in this list of questions, but I think it's a relevant topic, which we should discuss now. Because it's connected with your point about authoritarian way by which we sometimes deal with people, deal with their problems, and by which we sometimes try to impose uh, Srila Prabhupada in their lives. I completely agree with you that uh, this is a very dangerous way to go, uh, try to force uh, Srila Prabhupada upon somebody and force his authority upon somebody's life and uh, uh, it with all good intentions which may be behind that it will ultimately uh, result in a lot of disservice and disappointment. So Connected with this point which you gave right now, how we should be very careful about imposing uh, Prabhupada's authority upon others. Uh, there was a person I encountered who said that uh, because of this overemphasized importance of Srila Prabhupada in Iskon. Devotees don't develop spiritually. The, again, this is his opinion. I'm not subscribing to this opinion, but I think it's important to give the answer to this uh, notion or to this opinion. He said that because we always speak Prabhupada, 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 they tend to create a blind face in people. Uh, and uh, they become kind of blind followers of Srila Prabhupada. And, uh, you know, they don't think for themselves. Uh, they more or less, you know, join the cult, so to speak. Uh, where Prabhupada is everything and Prabhupada is the ultimate savior, this and that. Uh, and his point was that, uh, you know, this overemphasized um, 
importance of uh, Srila Prabhupada and relationship with Srila Prabhupada ultimately uh, doesn't help people to develop uh, genuine uh, faith, uh, which is which has an element of uh, self-reliance or I don't know if what is the proper word or the uh, the element of uh, independent uh, kind of um, need uh, to to develop spiritual practice. Uh, the person whom I'm talking about, I'm sure Mad Mohan knows whom I mean. He basically said that uh, you know we are distributing more or less superstitions. The the superstition way of uh, relating to the uh, scriptures uh, by uh, overemphasizing the importance of Srila Prabhupada. So what would you say? Superstitious, did you say? Yeah, because people, you know, they just, they believe in superhero who is Srila Prabhupada and they don't feel the need to develop their personal... Or did you mean uh, superficial? Superficial and superstitious also. You know, some sort of superstitions. Superficial as well, but superstitious as well. Uh, you know, when, uh, when they substitute the genuine face into the scriptures, into the logic of the scriptures by, uh, by superimposing, you know, uh, the figure of Srila Prabhupada, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to elaborate on his points too much, but uh, uh, basically he said that uh, more or less the overall emphasis of Srila Prabhupada overshadows uh, the scriptures and the need to develop a personal relationship with the scriptures, personal understanding of the scriptures, uh, something like this, you know. So that's uh, that's the opinion, which which is sometimes in one way or another way being declared. And I thought it's important to to speak about it because I also think it's very much connected with the previous point which you made. Uh, when uh, the understanding of Srila Prabhupada again based on it's the kind step, of force. The, the, force instead of instead accepting of, the spirit of the instruction yeah, accepting yeah, the letter of the instruction yeah and instead of being spontaneous in our relationship with Srila Prabhupada we feel the need you know because there is so much social pressure and uh, emphasis in the society to do this and things like this. So that's why, that's how it is connected in my mind with, with your previous point. But I think to some degree I already addressed it, but I'll expand on it, that I would say that an important, a, a very important relevant point is the motive behind the instruction that's given. And that any instruction that's given has to be, if it's really going to be for the welfare of others, it has to be free from envy. And uh, because it's described in the Bhagavatam, only when one is free from envy can he actually think of the welfare of others. And uh, Prahlad Maharaj, fifth canto of the Bhagavatam, Svastyastu, the, whatever that verse. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I I agree that to force Srila Prabhupada's instruction um, as a way of of correcting somebody. Huh? Can manipulating people, controlling people, people. controlling him is going to produce an unfavorable result towards Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> Why? Because Prabhupada wasn't that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and as I presented before, Prabhupada was always perfect. <laughs> but especially right now, I'm going to I'm listening to Prabhupada's conversations. I I've moved from the classes now. I've been for the last by maybe one two months listening to conversations how he's speaking to different people, and Prabhupada is so liberal <laughs> in many respects to whom he's speaking. He's very liberal even to his disciples. I was just reading the other day or something when Prabhupada was giving. Prabhupada was giving out Gayatri mantras to Jayananda. And uh, and Jayananda, he uh, he uh, he was asking uh, Prabhupada to help him with the pronunciation. And Prabhupada then had to had to ask them to, to give the pronunciation. And and then Prabhupada just broke out laughing. He said, Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You're sincere. Just chant it. <laughs> you know, can you imagine? You know, like, you know, he was even. I mean, that's how he was. That's how he was. Sometimes he was strict. He knew who to be strict with, and he knew how to be liberal with somebody. And uh, so it's the same way. I would say in in giving Prabhupada's instructions that that we have to try to understand what Prabhupada's attitude was when, when he gave those instructions. And, of course, it's very difficult to understand. And that's why I said before, sometimes Prabhupada gave one instruction to one person, and he gave a different instruction to somebody else. And if you look at them together, they look like they contradict each other. But actually, they don't contradict because, you know, Mahajano Yena Kata Sapanta, one has to understand, you know, the that uh, the solid truth of religious principles is found in the heart of an unadulterated vision of, a, of the Lord, and therefore one has to look for the substance of the instructions and not just look at the, what the, you know, the form is, the external. Prabhupada was a pure substance person, and uh, although some people may say that Prabhupada was also interested in form, but he embodied both substance and form. And uh, to somebody who looks upon the way that that Prabhupada has become the so prominent in, in, in our society and it eclipses almost so much of what uh, can be spontaneously inspired and learned and progressively advancing in Krishna consciousness because we've always have to reconcile it you know, and try to present it in a way that's you know, that, that's consistent with what the way Prabhupada presented it. I would say a lot of it has to do with the, the what is the reason behind it and the motive behind it. And if the motive is is pure, somebody won't be so disturbed. If the motive is uh, something there, mm -hmm. huh? Manipulative. When I met you, me, I'm manipulative. It's going to come out. It's going to come out. And you, and one person can say one thing that, that Prabhupada said, and it will be so inspirational. And some person can say the exact same thing, and the person will feel so manipulated. The same words. The same words. You know, it really depends on on the motivation behind the person who's presenting it. And that's why Prabhupada, I believe, he has always emphasized uh, substance. <laughs> that he wanted us to become free from manipulative motivations. He wanted us to become freed from envy. He wanted us to develop all Vaishnava qualities. And, uh, and he taught us by his example how to be perfect Vaishnavas. By his example, just as much and just as important than from his instructions. I don't know if I, uh, I mean, I didn't give a direct answer to the person who's, you know, he may say that we've too, too, too much institutionalized Prabhupada. Sounds to yeah. me like what, what you've suggested. 
And I'm yeah. saying, yes, it's possible, but uh, that some may have too much institutionalized Prabhupada. But whenever I tell anybody when I'm speaking about Prabhupada's movement, I, I always make the, the very strong claim that anybody who says ISKCON is has already made a false statement because ISKCON is so variegated that you can't make a statement what ISKCON is. You can't paint it with one brush stroke. There's so much variety in ISKCON and it's healthy. So if somebody is looking for somebody who's not institutionalizing Prabhupada, he'll find it in Prabhupada's movements. Everything is there. Yeah, I, I understand what you mean. And I very much agree with you that this, uh, this understanding which he tries to promote this particular person uh, is based on a very one-sided and uh, narrow understanding of what really is going on in this con because uh, in reality, we can see how some people uh, take this, uh, you know, emphasis on Srila Prabhupada in an uh, unhealthy way. There is no doubt about it. There is, there is some people who are taking it in not a very healthy way. But there is also plenty of people who are taking it in a very uh, proper and healthy and spiritually enhancing way so uh, i i very much agree with with this that uh, you cannot really brush uh, or you know paint is gone with one statement and there are so many people who develop a uh, very deep relationship with with uh, you know, with scriptures, with Krishna, with our practices, uh, and with Srila Prabhupada as well, uh, and not becoming, you know, the blind uh, followers or blind believers, so to speak. Uh, you know, the people who are, you know, like, it's, uh, it's a common religious phenomenon when uh, people they look for a savior and you know he is the sure savior and we just you know follow the sure savior and we are safe because we are connected with the savior uh, it's there it's it's a normal thing in any religious organization but it's not uh, uh, you know the only uh, phenomenon which which we can see there is so many very deep devotees being developed uh, and being inspired by Srila Prabhupada's personality. So I agree with, with your answer and with your analysis in this regard. Is there anything you'd like to add beyond that? Uh, yeah, there is a lot of things which I could add, but I think that the most important thing is that uh, is what you said yes this phenomenon is there it could be there the danger yes. is there yes yeah we should not we should not really uh, brush it away we should not really take it uh, uh, lightly there could be an unhealthy uh, sort of you know dynamic in the society as well where we become just you know some cult but uh, it's not necessarily the uh, it does it doesn't describe the whole situation accurately and it's not it's not i i wouldn't say it's even a prevalent uh, thing it's i would say it's ex it, it, it's there it exists but uh, i wouldn't say that this is the general tendency which is there i I think this assertion is very much wrong that uh, there is a very general, you know, tendency to take Srila Prabhupada and forget about everything else. Uh, uh, there are so many 
so many healthy development is there inspired by Srila Prabhupada and his liberal attitude and his broad mindedness and his, you know, and his attitude towards Krishna consciousness. And at the same time, as you said, this is the trick. The trick is not to go to uh, one extreme or another extreme, to become too liberal or to become too narrow minded. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, how to combine these two tendencies which are there, the chastity to Prabhupada's uh, teachings, uh, to Prabhupada's mood and to, to his parampara, uh, you know, message, and at the same time broad mindedness. And, uh, you know, there is definitely, uh, you know, a lot of uh, extremes on the other, uh, on the two sides of the spectrum. <laughs> So I, I guess the, we should find this uh, golden uh, balance. Yeah. So let's go to uh, to another question. We only have two questions. Uh, actually, fifth question you already answered. How to deal with seemingly contradictory instructions of Srila Prabhupada? How to avoid misinterpretations of his instructions? How do we understand which instructions we are to follow in a given situation? Now, maybe you can add something to what you already said, but you already mentioned a couple of times that the seeming contradiction is a result of different circumstances, different personalities to whom she will Prabhupada speaks and, and right. we should understand the principle behind it that you already said. Yeah, as far as uh, how do we understand which instructions we're to follow in a given situation, uh, we've also somewhat addressed that about the importance of, of, uh, of taking Security. shelter in, in the others, other Vaishnavas who we have confidence and trust that uh, they've given their lives to Srila Prabhupada, why couldn't they help me gain a better understanding of, of an important decision that I have to make in my life? And, uh, and therefore, uh, not simply relying on my own interpretation of, of Prabhupada's instruction according to time, place, and circumstance, but if everybody has someone in their lives that they trust, and they have faith and who inspire them as, as a true Prabhupada Nuga, then uh, why not seek guidance and direction in making an important decision and hear from them also? And, uh, and if it resonates, and, uh, and if we can't make the decision ourselves, even if it doesn't fully resonate, but if we follow it anyways faithfully, then Krishna will help it to resonate when the time is right for it to resonate by either helping us to understand it was the best approach to take because we didn't simply make it a based upon my own mental um, acceptance, yeah, impulse. <clears throat> but I took shelter of somebody else, and therefore I'll, I'll, I'll. I'll follow their good advice, their sound advice. That's another, another that's in the way that we certainly can uh, become more resolute in making a decision. It's interesting what you said. You know, I, I gave a lecture uh, uh, in during this hermeneutical course. Uh, you know, the hermeneutics was uh you know accepted by the gbc and uh, the whole hermeneutical process was described by the work of a group of scholarly devotees and i was asked to give some lectures on this topic so because that's very much related to this topic of hermeneutics how to make how to extract the meaning of what Prabhupada said, how to reconcile different statements, how to understand what is most important, how to understand the spirit. And, uh, you know, I was describing historically why uh, it is now the time to really 
develop the hermeneutical skill and hermeneutics is not it's a it's not only science it's an art in itself and as any art it has something which is <laughs> uh, you know not rationally or logically uh, describable there is also a kind of intuitive feeling which you have to develop that's right by, by knowing the you know the whole corpus of Srila Prabhupada and his message and kind of connecting with uh, this particular statement with the whole mood of uh, of Srila Prabhupada which is sometimes it, it, it's not entirely rational it's it's partially at least uh, intuitive and you know wholesome so but what i was uh, speaking that you know during Prabhupada's time hermeneutical process was very simple you know if you didn't understand something you could just ask Prabhupada you know <laughs> Prabhupada what do you mean <laughs> why, why you, you can write to him the letter you know and Prabhupada was so diligent and uh, you know in answering all the letters which he would receive so he would answer then when Prabhupada left then the hermeneutical process was also simple uh, more complex but still simple because behind Prabhupada there were his followers who very much knew uh, his instructions on a particular topic and the authority of these followers of Srila Prabhupada was uh, very much established in the society and impeccable everyone knew that you know, uh, Tamal Krishna Maharaj knows the most about Prabhupada's instruction about the management, for example, right? Because he was dealing in this relationship with him. And, you know, if you had some uh, doubts, you can always, you could always ask Tamal Krishna Maharaj, you know, and, and everyone knew that Jai Dvaita Maharaj uh, was the most trusted, you know, editor of Srila Prabhupada and uh, Jai Dvaita Maharaj and his crew, uh, you know, if you had some doubts about certain things, you could ask him. And, uh, you know, there were some other followers who's like Bhaktisvarup Damadar Goswami was, uh, you know, was the authority on BI and uh, Sadaputa Prabhu perhaps and some other people. And Brahmananda so, Prabhu was, was the authority on 26 Second Avenue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and of course, Satsvarup Maharaj was an authority on Prabhupada's life and Prabhupada's biography and details of this. And you know, there were so many prominent disciples uh, who were trusted by the society of the devotees because they knew that they had intimate relationship with Srila Prabhupada, and Srila Prabhupada personally trained them in, in, in certain areas, like you know, Yamuno, uh, some other people were trained as cooks. Uh, or, you know, or Bhakti Charu Maharaj were <laughs> personally trained as cooks and Prabhupada appreciated their cooking. There were people who were trained in deity worship and this and that. But what happened after that, you know, the authority of these people, of these followers of Srila Prabhupada was, uh, was somewhat shaken uh, or diluted uh, by uh, the criticism uh, offered by some detractors and uh, and by some other events which uh, unfortunate events which happened and uh, you know now people are lost more or less and therefore this hermeneutical process uh, or skill I wouldn't even say that this is just a uh you know methodical process it's rather a skill is very important and uh, uh, to do this hermeneutical process to be sure that you are speaking in accordance to Srila Prabhupada his mood and everything uh, you really have to uh, know a lot of Prabhupada said but not in a selected way but in a in a very wholesome way, so to speak, in a very, you know, complete way. And for that, you really understand, you, you have to really understand the essence of it, the, the, the core of it, 
the core teachings, you know, the, uh, the most important element of this hermeneutical process is to be trained in the core uh, teachings and the Siddhantas, to, to establish firmly Siddhantas and to understand how different uh, instructions of Srila Prabhupada are related to this uh, core eternal truth, Siddhantas, which are always there. And then you can understand that this is the instruction according to time, place, and circumstance. But this is the instruction which is eternal, which has eternal value. And then you can judge uh, the relative uh, weight, so to speak, of the uh, of this instruction and that instruction, uh, uh, because this is what what is needed to, to understand this instruction is more important than that instruction because this is a more particular case and this is more general instruction anyway so that's probably this whole thing we started in this bhaktivedanta university we started the course but uh, i'm not satisfied with the course i think we should really give a very elaborate you know, understanding what does it mean, how to uh, how to uh, extract the essence of uh, the particular uh, instruction, or uh, to understand what what this Prabhupada's mood and how to apply Prabhupada's mood in the uh, modern situation which we encounter with something like this. Yeah, even the topic of hermeneutics though could be so hard to resolve <laughs> it's yeah. uh, <laughs> no it's an art it's, it's an art i completely i was, I was just going to say I completely agree with the use of your word it's an art you know it's a, just like there's an art of sadhana there's an art of bhakti there's a you know there's a, it's an art of, hum, of hermeneutics you know uh, knowing how to accept uh, uh, what grounds what basis to accept statements from um, from an, an authority that should be you know revered worshipped and 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 uh, seen as as an absolute authority it's so hard it's so hard to to actually to come to an agreement and although as much as i hear about i'd be very interested to, to hear more about this hermeneutics class or that you're going to be giving uh, it's a uh, it's it's essential, but at the same time, I'm I'm, I'm a, I have to be say that I'm I'm wary that it doesn't become uh, too academic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, too academic and too too formalized. Too formalized. Yeah. Yeah. It should not give an impression that now you have a. Uh, you know, ready-made formulas, and by applying these ready-made universal formulas, you can, you know, basically know everything and decide everything and become an authority on everything and anything. Krishna so, just doesn't work that way. No. <laughs> so this one thing that we have to learn as we make advancement in Krishna consciousness is that Krishna is always free to act as he wishes. He always has his independent will and he's not going to conform to a set of rules. Yes. <laughs> Whatever rules yes. we lay down for him, he's not bound to conform to them. There's only one one, only one only means to, to bind him. <laughs> and it's not, yeah. by, rules and, and not yeah. by rules and regulations. <laughs> I guess it's a good way to conclude our dialogue on this topic because what you just said about Krishna is also applicable uh, in relationship to Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada is very much alive and you cannot really kill him by putting him into some, <laughs> you know, shape, uh, that shape which is, you know, which is... Uh, yeah, and start using him as a as a tool to exploit others. As a hammer. Yeah, hammer. <laughs> hammer yeah. yeah. Yeah, Prabhupada is very much alive and we should keep him alive. 
uh, by you know praying to him by speaking about him by hearing about him and by developing relationship with him and by appreciating how he is alive how he is how he is spontaneous and how he is liberal and at the same time so strict um, and how yeah. he's alive in the hearts of those who love him yeah yeah we still have five minutes to go so i guess we can answer a question from the listeners uh -huh. make it make our conversation more alive <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know who will give us the questions. Uh, is there anyone there? I don't see any questions in the chat, but I don't think it was meant to put the uh, question. Krishna, примите поклоны, пожалуйста. Uh -huh. Чат был выключен, сейчас его включили, и преданные могут написать свои вопросы в чат. Okay. So they just... They just turned on the chat and they uh, can have the questions, but... Uh, uh, oh, there's a lot of questions in the chat. No, but that's all the questions. Oh, no, those are the questions that we were covering. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right, um, got it. Got it. Uh, Maybe you can say a few words about the last question. How Prabhupada was de developing relationship with his disciple? What Srila Prabhupada liked in their behavior, mood and actions? Whom among his disciples did he consider to be close and dear? Whether any simple devotees, quote unquote, simple devotees who did not perform outstanding service, but whom Srila Prabhupada loved very much. Mm -hmm. Well, the last question, an obvious person is Jayananda Prabhu. <laughs> Prabhupada loved Jayananda, you know, and he was not, you know, he was not a big intellectual. Leader. In fact, the, Jayananda, he was the president of San Francisco, and uh, he asked Prabhupada if he could uh, leave presidency and, and, uh, he wanted to become a driver of a bus on Radha Damodar. And, uh, you know, he gave up position because he, he was just so you know, unassuming, unpretentious. And he, he was just, you know, he was always in the background. That was the one thing you always hear about Jayananda Prabhu. And Prabhupada just, Prabhupada just loved him so much that, you know, when he asked if he could be a driver on the bus, he just immediately told him, yes, please go. You know, and he let him drive a bus on Radha Damodar and he gave up his presidency. And uh, and the Prabhupada always talked about Jayananda in terms of how he gave his donation of five thousand dollars for the printing of his first book and and uh, things that Prabhupada said about Jayananda when he heard he departed. Prabhupada cried, you know. But and uh, he was just uh, he wasn't like a big but he, 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 he just wasn't, he wasn't a big splash, you know, no position. It just, it's just, and, but Prabhupada so much appreciated him. So he cried. And uh, after Jayananda departed, but he was, he wanted to hear everything about what Jayananda Prabhu was doing, you know, the circumstances of his departure. And, and uh, then he wrote that beautiful letter about Jayananda, I, I say he was a good example of somebody who was not, you know, but, but, but he was immortalized. Uh, he was so simple without a big position, but he was immortalized by Prabhupada because he loved his simplicity. And Prabhupada said that his departure day should be included in Vaishnava calendar. And, and not only that, but there shouldn't be a Rathiatra card in the movement without his picture on it. Every Rathayatra card, I'm always conscious of that. Every Rathayatra we ever had, every year, always had Jayananda Prabhu's picture on it. Always. He immortalized him. Prabhupada. Well, that's an example of somebody who is simple, but Prabhupada I, loved. I was told that 
Jayananda Prabhu was an exceptional case in the sense that while he was giving lectures, sometimes he would fall asleep himself <laughs> while giving the lectures. <laughs> Usually nobody does it. <laughs> they but he was always asleep. working so hard, he deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, that's the first person that came to my mind when I heard that question about Chai and Ananda Prabhu. You know, but uh, what was the... Uh, you also, you huh? also loved much Yamuna, who was not also, I mean... Uh, oh, was... yeah. Anil also loved Bhakti Sarup Damodar Swami. Yeah. He really loved Bhakti Sarup Damodar Swami. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Always talking about him. My scientist disciple. You know, he would always speak to him. In a very, very friendly way. And, uh, yeah, and, and he always, yeah. There's certain, of course, Bhakti Sarup Damodas, oh, he was a brahmachari. He was a brahmachari. He wasn't a big leader. He was Prabhupada's scientist, you know. It wasn't like that he was a big managerial leader. Of course, he was responsible for the Bhakti Vedanta Institute, but... I'm sure we could come up with a whole long list of devotees that, that Prabhupada loved who were simple, but these yeah. are the first ones that come to my mind. And Jamuna also, of course, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> you also loved very much Shyama Sundar Prabhu. Well, Shyama oh, Sundar yeah. was a big leader, but but still he was he was loved not because he was a big leader, but because he was <laughs> loved by Prabhupada. Yes. Yeah. Independently, irrespectively, of, you know, I uh, I just read this uh, this description in his book how other devotees decided that Shama Sundar should not be Srila Prabhupada's secretary, and they presented it to Srila Prabhupada, and uh, and kind of force Srila Prabhupada to reject him as a secretary and how Srila Prabhupada was it was it was very difficult for him uh, and uh, how he was almost crying actually he did agree with them and kind of went their way but at the same time he he gave so much love to Shyama Sundar Prabhu and you know it was 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 a very, you know, touching part. I'm really, I'm really vol reading volume three of uh, Chasing Rhinos yeah. with Swami right now. Yeah, that's, that's, Shana that's, Sundar really comes out with, it, you know, a lot of things about his lack of qualification and just Prabhupada's mercy in many places. You know, he's very frank, honest, can very candid, you know, about himself. Yeah. And this is from the third volume, yes, this story is from the third volume. Uh, we all already over time, but let me ask you the last question. Uh, we will not from Baba Bhavini. Can a person or a devotee blindly follow the process which was given by Srila Prabhupada? because he is not he or she is not very intelligent uh or, or yeah not very intelligent uh in other words uh can anyone uh be uh, broad minded there is a inborn uh yeah that there is some tendency for being sectarian uh, uh, it can be the um, manifestation of undeveloped intelligence. In other words, what she is asking, uh, you know, some people are blind followers because they just lack intelligence. Uh, can anyone develop the broad mindedness uh, and understand the essence uh, 
you know, because there is some, there may be some lack of material qualification to develop this particular quality of intelligence. So that's basically the essence of what she's asking. You know, would you be inclined? I, because I really don't fully understand the question and because you read it in Russian, would you be inclined to answer the question? Uh, I can, I can. Basically what she says, she says that uh, some people by nature are fanatical, sectarian, uh, narrow-minded, uh, and when they join Srila Prabhupada's movement, they become uh, fanatical sectarian followers of Srila Prabhupada. Uh, uh, how, you know, the, what is the chance for these people? We're talking about being liberal, being broad-minded, being this, being that, you know, but some people have natural limitations. Uh, and uh, my answer to these questions would be, uh, yes, there may be some um, pre-existing uh, tendencies in us, uh, but, uh, you know, we're made of the association. And if we associate with people and if we closely serve these people, then their quality uh, comes to us. Uh, that, that quality come to us and uh, we develop similar nature and similar attitude despite of our uh, lack of qualification or lack of, uh, you know, proper, you know, proper qualities in the beginning. So the question is proper association. If we are in a proper association, then even though the tendency for fanaticism or narrow-mindedness is there, uh, it will not manifest, it will not fructify because uh, the association is a very strong force and it uh, influences us more even than uh, inborn tendencies which are there. You know, even though these tendencies are strong as well, but the association is stronger, especially if we keep the proper mood in the association. If we're not trying to impose our uh, nature, deficient nature upon others, but rather serve others and see how others are doing, uh, we can develop similar nature despite uh, lack of, initial lack of qualification. So that would be my answer to this question. Uh -huh. I, I would say, the only thing that I would say in addition to that, which you've already said, essentially, is that Lord Chaitanya has said is, I will personally deliver anyone who chants Hare Krishna and doesn't offend Vaishnavas. Yeah. Yeah. The crux is not to offend Vaishnavas. And for that, you need good association. For that, you need the association with people who are not offensive or, and not defensive. <laughs> <laughs> because offenses usually come from defensiveness <laughs> <laughs> from some insecurities <laughs> anyway Niranjma, thank you very much for your association for giving two hours even more of your valuable time and i hope that this conversation will help many people to strengthen their relationship with Srila Prabhupada, which is, which will strengthen our movement and will make our movement better. Thank I, you, Maharaj. Thank, thank you for inviting me. And thank you for even considering that I'm somebody who's qualified to speak on this topic. It's very magnanimous of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I was enriched by this conversation with you and there is something to think about maybe i should write another book about Srila Prabhupada. actually I, I was planning to give a second volume of the book but uh, what you should do is you should make sure there's an english version yeah there is a work going on now uh, on english version i have to check what's going on that's essential that's essential Okay.
So we're going to end here then. Thank you, yeah. Mara, Thank yeah. you for, for inviting Thank me you. and uh, stay in touch. Yeah. Maybe organizers can uh, uh, let uh, everyone unmute and, you know, give some some last feedback to us if somebody That's wants no, just just you know just a few words anyway 154 people are there in zoom so it's good so you can show. was this streamed also on youtube yeah it was streamed on youtube uh -huh. and then probably more people are there in youtube Okay, thank you. I, I guess, guess that's, is that what we, is that why we're staying on? Is this just to see this video of Paul Prabhupada or? <laughs> no, that's, I think, Mad Mohan turned it on, but you know, uh -huh. nobody. Speaks. Okay, if Srila Prabhupada didn't come, this. Didn't come. Uh, yeah. What would happen? What would happen? How, that's right. would, we, how would we live how our we, life? How would we live our lives? Uh-huh. Hare Krishna. All right, okay. I'm going to, to go. Okay. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Praise to Prabhupada. Praise to Srila Prabhupada.